for uh, taking the time to um, hear the galaxy story. Um, I'll try and whiz quite uh, quickly through because I believe we're overrunning. Um, we are an Australian listed company um, and a producer and developer of uh, lithium projects around the world. Uh, we first started off life with our hard rock mine in uh, Western Australia uh, and that went back into production at the end of the first quarter of this year. Uh, we also have a pre-DFS stage project uh, in Quebec, in Canada, called James Bay. And last but not least, we have our flagship development project, which is a very large um, salar in Argentina. Actually, it's on the eastern hemisphere of the same salar. Uh, there are Remueto as uh, FMC Lithium, one of the top three producers in the world. Um, today, our market cap is about uh, 550 million Australian dollars, and uh, as Tracy indicated yesterday, we've um, uh, had a bit of tailwinds in terms of our price performance over the past uh, um, six to 12 months. Um, I, I would add that uh, a lot of that performance I would attribute to uh, essentially over the past two and a half years since I became uh, CEO of the company, uh, we've had to take the company through uh, a fairly long stretch of financial restructuring where the company had over $200 million of net debt and uh, was in a very poor shape as far as its balance sheet was concerned. So, so that basically got cleared up uh, by the end of last year and uh, with the restart of production, I think uh, that's probably uh, created not only a flaw in terms of a going concern uh, in terms of the company's value, uh, but also obviously uh, looking to unlock some, some more value through uh, incremental cash flows going forward. Um, our institutional share, our shareholder base has been quite institutionalized over the past uh, uh, six to nine months as well, and you probably see some familiar names in the top 10 uh, there as well. Uh, today, our net debt is down to about uh, $20 million, uh, $20 million uh, from a peak of well over 200 uh, about two or three years ago, uh, and it's more than uh, a manageable balance sheet for us uh, today. Um, just of note, um, we do actually have a 50% partner, uh, operating partner uh, in Mount Catlin, um, which is also listed as a company called General Mining, also in Australia. Um, they're valued at uh, essentially about $180 million, so obviously if we're 50-50 on that, um, then you could say that out of our 550 market cap, about 370 is being ascribed to South of Eda at the moment. Um, what's happening in the lithium space, I, uh, I'm actually based in Asia, I spend a lot of time in China and have done so for the past uh, close to 20, 24, 25 years. Uh, a lot of growth has actually been driven out of Asia. Um, essentially, as of last year, we had about 160,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalents consumed in the world. Uh, that essentially is going to be growing at a rate of approximately 20,000 tons per annum uh, over the course of the next 10 years. So essentially, uh, looking to add another 100,000 tons by the end of this decade and another 100,000 tons thereafter by 2025. Most of that growth, uh, as you know, uh, is going to be coming from uh, the battery sector. Uh, lithium obviously is used in many other applications such as grease and uh, industrial applications such as thermoplastics, glass and ceramics, uh, but batteries is the sector that's grown uh, the fastest. Um, essentially, consumer electronics will continue to uh, be a, uh, a bellwether for growth. Um, while the, the number of units of consumer electronics and gadgets are, are not necessarily growing exponentially, uh, each generation of uh, these devices that we have, for example, this uh, smartphone that I have here, essentially, um, you're essentially consuming somewhere in the region of uh, triple to quadruple the amount of lithium that you would have done if you were using a, a Nokia dumb phone. Uh, each of those generation of phones are, are more demanding in terms of applications and, and the same uh, applies to things like iPads and also laptops. So energy density is increasing and therefore consumer electronics continues to drive a lot of that growth. A lot of the headlines uh, in recent years have obviously been garnered from the transportation sector uh, and note that I describe this particular segment as transportation uh, as opposed to electric cars, uh, because my view of the world is essentially that uh, transportation driven by not only those uh, vehicles that have four wheels, but two wheels, six, eight, and 10 wheels, uh, are increasingly going to be uh, quite dominant in terms of driving that growth. Last but not least, I think what I am expecting is probably by the time we hit somewhere between 2020 to 2025, um, we will start to see a, a, a major pickup in terms of uh, lithium consumption through distributed storage, whether it's mass energy storage or, or home storage uh, segments. So um, essentially what's happening in China today, um, a lot of you would have heard uh, 
a lot about uh, the pricing that's happening in China. So today in China, you basically have uh, a situation where historically China has been the price taker. Uh, it used to be uh, dominated by uh, the South Americans. So. Uh, traditionally, SQM used to set the price and then everyone else followed. Uh, but what's basically happened over the last four or five years is that if you look at that bottom uh, left-hand chart, uh, basically most of the lithium battery manufacturing capacity in the world now sits in China. So just to put that in perspective, um, China as a single market basically has more capacity in terms of manufacturing uh, today than Japan and Korea combined on a 1.5x basis. Uh, and more capacity has actually been built up in, in China as we speak. Um, a lot of the headlines obviously is, is gotten by the, uh, the tea company uh, a little bit down, further down south with their uh, new gigafactory and 35 gigawatts of, uh, of um, capacity that they're looking to build out by the end of the decade. I mean, that will essentially consume about 28,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent, but uh, as I mentioned yesterday, to put that in perspective, one customer in China, the top cathode producer in the world, is a company called Hunan Shanshan. Uh, they will consume 14,000 tons this year. So that is the equivalent of 50% of what the Gigafactory will do maybe in five years' time. And then you have another uh, three or four companies uh, following Shanshan who are probably only about 20, 30% kind of behind them in terms of uh, scale and expansion. So a lot of that growth is happening in China, and that's why today we start to see China becoming a price maker in terms of lithium carbonate um, and lithium hydroxide. Essentially, uh, you have uh, a range of pricing in China. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we don't have a spot market for lithium, so really we should not be calling a spot price. But if you were to buy, if you did not have an annual contract or a master contract uh, that covered several years and you wanted to buy, let's say, small volumes of 30, 50, 100 tons, uh, you would be paying somewhere in the region of about 20 to 22,000 US dollars net uh, per ton. That's after deducting the VAT and customs and excise. Uh, duties for exporting the product out of the country. Um, if you had a master contract, and, and these are some of the probably most recent trades, uh, that pricing will probably be in the region of plus or minus 13,000 US dollars net, which is a 4-2x doubling of uh, what it was last year. Okay. So going forward, um, you know, I think a lot of these uh, these data points you would have read in the news, um, China wanting to electrify a lot of its transportation sector, so um, I will probably just skip through that. Uh, but it's not just about China. Uh, a lot of countries around the world are also now driving through initiatives to actually um, uh, electrify the transportation sector, uh, especially the likes of uh, the Netherlands and Norway, which today at 23%, uh, I believe it is, uh, has the highest penetration of new energy vehicles uh, globally. Uh, in terms of uh, our comps, uh, we are a uh, producer, and um, this is basically just a side-by-side -side comparison by some, with some of our peers in the industry. And uh, some of the things that make Galaxy a little bit unique is that uh, not only do we have uh, uh, production and cash flow, but uh, we also have diversity of assets, which is important because uh, over, let's say, a 10, 15 year cycle, we are obviously going to be expecting kind of different pricing levels at different points in time, de depending on the demand and supply. Uh, what a brine and hard rock mix of assets allows us to do is actually to survive and actually make uh, very good returns, either in the high pricing environment that we have now, or should uh, we see uh, a correction back down to, in my view, is that if it does correct, we probably would not correct down to uh, a five-digit level, but it may be somewhere in the, on an average long-term basis, somewhere between 10 to 12,000 US dollars a ton. Um, that essentially would put a squeeze on uh, hard rock margins, but if you're running a brine operation that's sub 3,000 US dollars per ton production, uh, you're still obviously making some very good returns there. Uh, just quickly through um, our assets, um, essentially we have uh, Mount Catlin and, and the uh, original economic study uh, pegged this at about 100,000 uh, tons of uh, production of uh, lithium concentrate a year. We've actually invested enough capex to actually take us up to 200,000. Our target for next year is going to be 150,000 and uh, we've got 120,000 tons spoken for by way of offtake already. Uh, we secured 60,000 tons of offtake sales already this year at 600 US dollars a ton, which was uh, close to 50% uh, uplift in pricing. Um, as I indicated yesterday, at 100,000 tons uh, on 600 pricing, um, the project will probably throw off somewhere in the region of about 66 uh, million Australian dollars per annum. 
in terms of cash flow. And uh, I think uh, the guidance that I've been given to the market is obviously we're looking at a 50% uplift uh, in terms of uh, production volumes and uh, maybe another 20, 25% uplift in pricing. So that will probably uh, lift the uh, operation and financial scale of the project uh, somewhere into the 100 to 120 million dollars of cash flow, uh, free cash flow from the project uh, going forward next year. Um, I'll talk briefly about uh, Sao Vida as well. It's a very large asset. Uh, importantly, it sits in Sao and Catamarca province, and our neighbor is FMC Lithium, which is one of the top three global uh, lithium producers in the world uh, today. We uh, have a very long mine life, 40 years, a million tons of lithium carbon equivalent, and four million tons of potash. Uh, we actually completed a, a bankable de uh, feasibility study uh, a couple of years ago. We're actually going through a formal revision of that, uh, given a lot of the macro and policy changes happened in Argentina as well as the uh, devaluation of the currency, which obviously would uh, lend itself favorably to uh, the economic uh, adjusted numbers uh, in our capex. But last but not least, the original uh, MPV that we had for the project was only about $380 million, uh, based on the average selling price of about $5,500 US dollars per tonne of lithium carbon. Obviously, that will be adjusted going forward, and uh, I think uh, we should expect to see probably somewhere in the region of 2 to 3x uplift uh, in terms of that MPV once we complete the, uh, the DFS um, in the, uh, by mid part of this year. Uh, so our to-do list is essentially between uh, May and June, expect us to make some formal announcements in terms of uh, a new owners team that we're putting together and this will be fielded uh, with a lot of grey hair and industry professionals. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the lithium sector, essentially over the last 20 years there's only been about three or four projects that have been built. So the number of uh, competent professionals that obviously have a lot of experience in that is also very limited and we'll be look to, we would look to be fielding our team with uh, you know, essentially XFMC, Rockwood and SQM. Uh, professionals who essentially, in aggregate, I think the current estimate is somewhere between 160 to 180 years of experience uh, between them. Uh, by June, uh, we'll be uh, publishing our revised DFS, and then the second half of the year, we'll be completing our offtake discussions as well as our uh, debt and equity financing for the project. Um, I'll briefly mention James Bay. Uh, this is uh, in Quebec. It's about uh, 22, 23 million ton uh, resource, and we're going to be just uh, starting some additional exploration work and advancing uh, towards preparing for a DFS um, later on in the year. So um, what do we have to look forward to? Essentially, Mount Catlin, uh, back in production and ramping up cash flows, uh, uh, sorry, ramping up production this year. Uh, we expect to be actually hitting um, that 100,000 ton run rate uh, by the summer, uh, and essentially looking for expansion going into uh, next year as well, as well as uh, some very accretive cash flows. South of Eda, uh, we have uh, a new DFS and a new team. Uh, that will be published and, and announced by the, uh, by the middle of this year, and then the second half of the year we'll be looking to advance that project through uh, financing and, and offtake. Uh, and last but not least, obviously, as everyone's aware, um, we're still in a very robust environment as far as we are concerned in terms of uh, lithium demand and lithium pricing, and uh, my own view is that uh, that's probably going to be the case for the next uh, at least three to five years. So with that, thank you very much. Okay.